Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Sim Sundays podcast by Gridfinder. This week, we are back from the Sim Racing Expo. We've been spamming you with endless little mini episodes from the Expo, which has been a lot of fun, and we'll, we'll talk about the Expo in a bit. But I'm joined by the legendary, mythical Jardier. <laughs> welcome, Jardier. How are you doing? Hello, hello, hello. Thank you so much for having me, guys. I'm good, thank you. Good. Well, um, so I'm noticing that you're wearing a T-shirt that says just one more race, which is kind of ironic, right? Because how many races have you had today? Well, two, two, only two, basically. I need the two. But OK, but how long were those races? Well, one was 23 hour race, one was three hour race. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. OK, yeah. So so it's a it's a fair amount of racing straight off the back of uh, of Expo, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was been busy week. Yeah, I was getting uh, trying to get everything together after the expo, you know, like uh, getting back on emails and and work and everything, and, uh, and now grinding over the weekend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was watching some of your uh, your race earlier with um, with Eries, the, uh, the the Gran Turismo Gran Turismo Seven streamer, and turns out pretty decent ACC driver too. Oh yeah, yeah, it was great. It was uh, great energy together and uh, good fun. Yeah, it was. Uh, it's interesting to see people coming from different games and from basically like a different YouTube scene and uh, driving together. It's very interesting. Yeah, I was enjoying. Uh, I was enjoying watching it from from his point of view because from his point of view, when I first tuned in, I think I hadn't quite clocked who he was driving with, and I was like, oh, he's got a crew chief. I was like, oh, hang on, this crew chief sounds a lot like Jardier. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> he's basically got Jardier as his own personal crew chief. This is pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I mean, it was great fun. I really didn't know what to expect, and after talking to Rory at the same expo, I knew it's gonna be good fun. So yeah, I'm I'm glad it turned out okay. Yeah, it turned out very well. Well, I, I had to uh, I had to stop watching when you were. I think you you were up to about fifteenth. How did you finish? Uh, I think we finished P thirteen in the end. So nice. Not too bad. Not too bad for basically unexperienced Rory driver. His first ever endurance race in ACC in a car that he doesn't drive and on track he doesn't properly know. So I think it's a pretty good job. Yeah, I would say that's a pretty solid effort there by Rory. And it was great to it was great to meet Rory at the at the expo. In fact, we'll we'll get into the expo in a bit. Firstly. Thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. We spoke briefly um, at the expo last weekend about uh, the Sim Sundays podcast and you guys coming on. Um, and what we like to do at Sim Sundays is we like to kind of go through the story of you, like how you got here, how you became a streamer. So we'll try and stay away from the whole Twitch versus YouTube, <laughs> ACC versus iRacing debates, but inevitably they will they will creep in um, and start with the beginning right so if you don't mind tell us how it all started what did you do before you were a sim racing streamer oh mate like like the thing is i'm doing sim racing like literally my almost whole life i i started like obviously i was playing all the types of games when i was a kid like everything since 90s and such but online racing i started doing in 2004 uh, my friend in school, he told me about this live for a speed game where you can apparently drive online against the other people. So I downloaded the demo, we started driving and I think it took like a month and we bought the game, we got ourselves the first wheels and we started driving online. Yeah, and uh, I was doing like a lot of, lot of, lot of, lot of racing for a very long time and four years ago, I think it is, or almost five now, I uh, decided to take it a little bit more seriously in a way that I just like enjoyed the content. I was uh, working at the Samsung uh, for quite some time and I had some free time. So I started watching like people doing YouTube and streaming and stuff like that. But I didn't watch any sim racing. And after watching some of the streamers, I was like, wow, this is really cool. I would like to do something like that as well. Because for me, it was really hard because like literally one of my friends did sim racing, but nobody cared too much around me so what i really wanted was i knew i was like decent i was doing esport races i was racing like i racing world championship and stuff like that but nobody around me cared too much so i wanted someone to at least like see my hot lap and say man that was good lap or something like that you know and uh, and i was like wow okay i can maybe start doing this and i, I literally like four or five years ago i project cars two released and i was like okay i'm gonna take it seriously i'm gonna start doing videos and uh, I just, yeah, I just start learning it and started doing it. And it, here we are now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's crazy. I like, I can see just over your, uh, your left shoulder there, your YouTube ticker with the 94,000 subs. That's, that's quite a, a serious progression in five years, right? 
Yeah, yeah, I mean, I never did expect that, to be fair. Like, uh, because, like, for first three years, I gained, like, 10,000 subscribers, I think. And then, basically, like, a year ago or two years ago, it blew a bit more. Right, so it's the classic grinding scenario where it's, you know, yeah. it takes a long yeah. time to kind of get yeah. that exponential curve. Exactly, yeah, exactly. And, uh, yeah, obviously, pandemic helped, I guess, you know, like, I started Corsa as well, like, was the main game I started playing. So, yeah, like, it, it blew up, it blew up a bit. Well, I, I, you know, I'm really excited to go into some details here and ask you about all the games, but I kind of, I want to know a little bit about your first ever broadcast. I, I, this is a question I've asked a couple of people, because I'm really intrigued about the first, the first time you kind of bought a webcam you strapped it to, I don't know, your screen or like just something like the wall or wherever it is. And then you have to go through and you find out, right, if I press this, it, like, does this mean I'm live or not? Oh. Like, I, I, you check it on your phone. Like, tell us about your first ever video. I think it's so hard to tell because like, I, I, uh, I, since like 2012, I was putting like a hot laps on a YouTube, but it wasn't like, I really didn't care. It was like, I basically uploaded hot up on a YouTube and I shared it with my friend. You know, that was the main, mm -hmm. main basically mm -hmm. thing, the reason I was using YouTube. And, uh, and first time with the camera was like, I think 2017 or something. I like turned on the camera and I bought the, like the cheapest Logitech webcam. Like everybody was using that Logitech. Yeah, yeah. People still use it. I still have it as a fellow cam now, <laughs> the same very camera. And I used like I had like headphones with like an absolutely terrible microphone, you know, and everything was like so so bad, you know, like bad FPS. And like mm -hmm. basically, like, I, I think if you ask almost every single content creator, they will tell you that they had like a, the shittiest camera, the shittiest computer, the the worst audio, and everything like that, you know. Because, yeah, yeah. Well, everyone's first stream is an experiment, right? I I, like, yeah. I think there's very very few streamers who are now yeah. at like fifty thousand subscribers or more who like knew from the very first video right this is this is what i'm going to do in five years and i'm going to grow it to this many hundreds of thousands of followers and it's going to be my career it's always an experiment yeah 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 like for, for me it never was like i didn't like care about the numbers too much for me it was basically i was do, like i'm doing semester for like i said 70 years now basically almost 18 years and I just love it so much. I'm happy I can share it with someone else now. You know, I'm so happy we built like the community around it, and it's just it's just so so nice to mm. to have this, to have like the the feedback from people and such. But I really like didn't too much. Obviously, it's nice when it turns into your job. Yeah. But it never wasn't like it never was an idea basically for that. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just I just wanted to like at the evening just do some race or video or stream and see how it's gonna end up. You know. So what did you do in your first live video? Like, what, what, what game was it? What did you decide to do? So I think I, I did some, like, hot laps videos in Acid of Corsa 1. It was, like, lap on North Shire or something like that. And then Project Cars 2 released, and I was like, wow, this game is nice. I did really enjoy it. Mm. And I started doing uh, eSport in Project Cars 2, like, right when it released. It was uh, ESL eSport. Like, like, it was, like, one race on Sunday, and it was, like, for prize money. And I started recording myself for these races. And, like doing the commentary basically mm. exactly the thing i'm doing now yeah <laughs> but just more <laughs> worse quality way worse quality <laughs> worse english and everything and uh and i think when i reached like suddenly i i get like i was having like i don't know 100 subscribers or 200 subscribers for like years it was basically all my friends and everything and and then i started doing these project cars too and suddenly in december i gained like 1100 subscribers the algorithm like, found you it was like absolutely insane. It was like, it was absolutely insane. And I still don't understand like how that happened, why that happened. I mean, it was literally one month, you know, then it was way less the next month. Yeah, yeah. And, and for like two years. But that one month, suddenly I get like 1,500 subscribers. It was like so crazy, you know? And, uh, and then like four, and it's basically, I, I date my channel start like to that day. I think it's 2017, December. Like, I basically say that's where my channel started because like a month before or two months before I started doing a little bit more serious videos. And, and then I think March or April in 2018, I did my first ever stream. And it was all thanks to George Ortner. He was streaming Race Room back in the day. Mm. And uh, he like, I was like watching his streams and I was like, wow, I need to try that as well. I think we did like Race together and he was like, you should try to stream as well, you know? <laughs> and and it was wild. It was crazy. Yeah, it's, it was uh, so weird and so awesome at the same time. And I immediately fall in love, you know? I'm yeah. like, as, as you can see, I'm a talkative person. I like to talk and, and I never shut up. And, <laughs> and 
I I've realized that I like doing videos. I, I I'm I'm very bad in making videos, but I like talking and doing stuff. And I feel like the streaming is just perfect for me because you have like the immediate interaction with people, and it's so nice. Yeah. So there's a couple of things there. The first the first thing I want I want to talk about is you know your first few streams where there's literally one or two people watching right every streamer presumably like most streamers unless they're a celebrity first most streamers will have to go through that period where yeah. they might have a whole stream where they're like well there's one or two people watching maybe like did you talk all the way through those or you know have you uh, always been the same or, or did you did you kind of pick it up as the numbers picked up i actually i think i was actually a bit lucky because i literally i think before my first stream i gained like 2000 subscribers so i had i think like 2000 subscribers before my mm. first stream and when i did my first stream i think we had already like 70 viewers or 60 viewers like that first stream we did wow. i think maybe it was plus 50 i think i think we can still see it on some youtube analytics mm -hmm. and I, I was actually checking it like uh, half a year ago and i think it was like plus 60 viewers already that first stream so it was like obviously so much easier you know like yeah. it was absolutely something else already like but I was lucky because I like I think in the streaming you you probably have to start doing videos first and then transfer it to stream or something. If you just turn on the camera now and start streaming, as you said, you will have that one one viewer, you know. So yeah. And did you did you always stream in English? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. I did yeah. One stream in Czech, but it was like for like a company they wanted to make like a. Uh -huh. I think it was Asura Corsa review and they wanted to make a stream in Czech. It was so weird. <laughs> it was so weird. <laughs> it must have been quite confusing for your regular uh, your regular viewers. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's interesting actually, because there's not too many streamers that I know of who's who English isn't their their first language that, that I've kind of um watched. Would you say that has has streaming improved your English or would your English have improved anyway? Do you do you think it's have you been is it something you've been conscious of? Oh yeah, like I mean, I mean, I was obviously learning English since I was a little kid, and um, always really liked it. And I was watching movies and learning in mm -hmm. the movies and such. But if you would watch my stream for from four years ago video and now, you would probably see like a massive, massive difference. <laughs> that would be interesting. And do you know what's kind of cool? It's like you know, so many people uh, they will learn English through TV, right? TV and yeah, movies. Yeah, that was me. That was me. Yeah. Yeah, I I wonder how many people have learned English through watching your stream. Games, man. M MMO games and uh, uh -huh. and and, re and uh, TV shows. That was my school. <laughs> right. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. So Project Cars Two. You started. Project Cars Two sounds like it's where the streaming career, if you like, kicked yeah. off. Where did it progress to next? Why Why did you move on? Because there must have been some kind of. Um, nervousness almost you know there's a lot of people that say if you if you stream one thing and then you change to another then you know the algorithm will hate it and blah blah blah, blah. What, what, what tell us about your transition away from project cars 2 i mean there, it was quite simple because so i was doing project cars 2 and race room because that was basically two main games plus i was also occasionally doing iRacing some like some endurance race for like 24 Le Mans, for example and mm -hmm. stuff like that but like my two main games was race room and project cars 2 so the transition like next wasn't too bad. Like basically the the thing is that the Project Cars 2 was like dying in a way, you know? Yeah. The game like has a cult following though. There's a lot of people who love it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, I mean, and, I, and even now swear by it. Yeah. Me still sometimes remember with some of people of our community, we were like, man, those four years ago when we did the Renault Clio Cup or something, you know, it mm -hmm. was so hilarious because that game like was great. You know, like that game was honestly great. But why? Why was it? Why was it so good? Because you can race Renault Clios in a set of Corsa, right? But it doesn't yeah, yeah. seem to have caught on the same way that it did in Project Cars Two. The online system was like very easy. You know, it was mm -hmm. like easy to host the races. The leaks were great. The netcode wasn't bad at all. The damage model was nice as well. You had the weather changes, the different night and day, and you could as you, like, you could drive Renault Clio on a Neuschleife. You could drive GD3. You could drive some Formula cars and. It was like a really good variability, you know, and mm -hmm. I think that's why it was good. And the physics wasn't bad at all. Like, honestly, I think like the obviously when you compare it to ACC, the, the, the physics is obviously different, but yeah, it wasn't bad. You know, the physics was like drivable. And it was good fun, you know, and, I, and did I you think, try Project yeah. Cars 3? No, no, I, I haven't even tried. No, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> How come? I mean, because, like, I don't know, like, when you're old as me and you play games as long as I, when you see already some videos from the game, you uh -huh. immediately can't tell if it's good or not, you know? And Project Cars 3 was immediately 
visible that it was really bad, you know. That so. must have been kind of sad though, given it like was, your like was. your like emotional attachment to Project Cars too. Yeah, yeah. For me, it was really bad because I when Project Cars One, if you I don't know if you remember, but Project Cars One got basically founded by community, right? They did like a not Kickstarter or maybe Kickstarter, something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. And I remember I paid like thirty euros for the Project Cars One. As like like a Kickstarter or founder or something like that, they actually paid me like two hundred euros back in a you know back because they were like giving mm -hmm. the money back you know to the people. yeah yeah and I was so happy how Project Cars One developed to Project Cars Two because it was a really good game and I mean like it was probably the best game back in the day like obviously you had iRacing, racing but uh, then in terms of like other driving this game was insanely popular and it was really sad to see how it went down you know so then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you um, when you race, you, you you know you're one of these streamers who uh, it's just as much about watching the performance as it is the entertainment, right? So so some you know some streamers it's all it's all about the entertainment. You go there just to have a have a laugh, and they're not bad races. Like they're probably very good races. Like I, I immediately Lawrence de Souza springs to mind. Like I watch his his racing, not necessarily to watch the racing, but just because he's very entertaining to watch. <laughs> but then if you watch someone like yourself or or Dave Cam, you're always you're always like racing at a particular level and so you get this as a viewer you kind of get an additional element that you're watching which is kind of like you're, you're watching for racecraft. oh would yeah, you would yeah. you would you you know is that like a conscious thing is that, is that is that kind of like where you where you're trying to position yourself or is it just happened because like you've just done that much and got that good i i don't know really i feel like i'm trying like so i feel like always i try to position myself in like an esport driver entertainer you know, like something like in between. But yeah. I was always like, I always like when you when you watch like a normal esport drivers, like I'm talking like four years ago, not basically now, but it was like this. You know, they sat behind a computer, no word said. You know, four hundred percent focus. Yeah. And basically, always for me, it was when I raced with my friends. Even when we did like a go kart race, it was like we were fighting for a P1, but at the same time we were like waving at each other, <laughs> you know, and and giving each other finger and whatever, You're just making like like connecting with like fun, you know. Yeah. I mean, and, that must uh, be intense, though, right? Because you, yeah. like, when you're racing at that level, if you look... So, obviously, at the expo, we had, we had that kind of, like, paddock area, and you could see everybody racing, and they were so focused and so intent. <laughs> but you race at that level, but at the same time, you're, like, chatting to people on the stream, you're reading the chat, like, you're looking at YouTube. Like, yeah, you've got all this stuff going on. It's like, oh, one of the things I'm doing at the moment is the race. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, like you have to be unique some way, you know, if you want to people want to, you know, so either either you have to be super funny like Jimmy Broadband or you have to be like extremely talented in some other like fastest like Yarno yeah. Opmir, for example, you right. know, yeah, like yeah. it's like a two different. So, you know, so I'm trying to be like in the middle somewhere, like driving decent and at the same time and like showing the people that they can have fun while, right. while, while racing, you know. So at what point through this this journey then were you like, right, OK, this is this this is what I can do. I can now make this a thing. This is this is no longer an evening's hobby. This is now kind of my main thing. Because there must have been a point where you started to think, oh, I'm getting close to this being a, you know, a viable career. Yeah, I mean, I never take it until today, like as a business thing or something like that. I always take like I, I take it as a hobby, you know. So for, for me, it's really hard to, yes, it's my job. But at the same time, I basically take it as like my hobby. Mm. So I, I can't take it like too seriously in a, in, a, in a thing, you know, so I have a problem transitioning in this when I'm dealing with some companies who want to promote or who want to become partners or something like that. Yeah, uh, it, it's sometimes really hard for me to be like, OK, this is not just you driving, at the, like having fun, but you also have to like deal mm. with this and this and this and do some contract and whatever. So for me, it's very, very difficult, like very, very difficult. And the transition itself, like, was really difficult as well, because... Yeah, obviously, like, sim like if you want to make it in sim racing as a job, it's really, really hard. It's really difficult, and the transmission for me was, yeah, very hard. <laughs> I, so, I would say, like, I, I was waiting until the last moment I can do something like that, you know? Yeah. So, so why is it so hard? Is it is it because it, you know, is there an element of it like you're worried that this hobby that you're so passionate about might become a little tainted? by the fact that it now feels a bit more like work because there's contracts and meetings and w was that the worry or was it something else yeah i mean i saw it in the past four years you know people come and go so you can also see, also see that there is like there are some people who are like okay cma6 is gonna be my job and then they mm -hmm. put too much pressure on them and they burn out immediately basically yeah. you know yeah yeah so i think uh, 
like obviously the simulation is super super small compared to anything else in the gaming. So like the people who are actually like making it as a living is, I think you can probably count on one one hand or two hands, you know. Yeah. Because it's it's literally like if you if you watch someone who is doing like I don't know Fortnite stream and have twenty thousand viewers, it's completely different when you compare it to sim racing when you have hundred viewers, you know. Mm-hmm. So, but on the other hand, the, the audience is like very mature in the sim racing because sim racing is like very hard to get into. So it's also like advantage for sim racing. But yeah, this this is very difficult. Yeah. So, what what's what's most important to you then, when as a as a sim racer who who streams and has a community around them? What's more important to you if you could either, let's say, um, I don't know, win the race at Expo or gain an extra ten thousand followers? Like, what's what's what motivates you? Is is it the is it the viewer numbers and the community that you're building, or or is it the the sport? For me, it's like a like a satisfaction of the racing. You know, like. Uh... I've, like obviously, like the numbers are important, but at the same time, the numbers are not that important if you want to race good, you know. Mm-hmm. So for 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 me, like I said, I'm doing CMC for 17 years, you know, and uh, and people are like, man, you're streaming for right two years now, and you're doing it too much, you know, you're gonna burn out. I'm like, dude, no, I'm I'm not gonna burn out because I'm doing this for 17 years, you know. How do you think I keep <laughs> yeah. going, you know? And the thing is, for me, I am very good in finding competition that drives me forward, mm-hmm. you know. I could obviously join a league. Where I will be P1 every single race and I will be bored in the end. Yeah. And for me, it's better to have like insanely close race and finish P3 is much better than winning by miles. You know, and, and for me, it's like a personal satisfaction if you can beat the best drivers and, and beat them and win them over them. So that's what I always try to find. Like I'm always trying to find the competition. Yeah. And, and that basically keeps me going. You know, it's, it's, so it really is the racing that that's motivating you more yeah, than yeah, the yeah. the kind of the the entertaining. I, mean, I, I didn't start doing this for for money or anything. I I basically yeah. started doing this because I wanted someone to say, "Hey, good race," you know. And uh, until someone will ride that in my tent, I'm gonna be happy. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, so so we uh, we we just uh, got back from the the sim racing expert the weekend in Nuremberg, uh, done by ADAC, and huge shout out to Danny Juicer and his team at Kavana for organizing that because god the guy i've never seen a person look so stressed in all my life <laughs> but he seemed to be uh, he seemed to be having a good time towards the the end there and he created an incredible event how was it for you meeting everybody oh, i was brilliant like I, I was brilliant because i was at the first servicing expo in 2014 in near brook Ring, and then my next servicing expo i was in 2019 at near brook Ring, and and then now yeah. So obviously, like from completely nobody, probably no no one ever knew me in 2014. Then in 2019, I had like I don't know 15,000 subscribers, and I was there for like an hour only because we were doing like a video with Cupra. Uh, and then going to Expo in 2022 was like that was insane, like absolutely insane. So it was absolutely brilliant. I'm very happy it went well because a lot of people were obviously skeptical about the new location, but mm. I think it was perfect yeah obviously uh, things could go better but mm. i think like in as it was it was like a really amazing and uh i was very positive from all the weekend i enjoyed it massively and i honestly can't wait for next time i saw um i i as we were walking through the the paddock area around the stage i saw you were getting stopped quite a lot by people for for photos how, how was that i i don't mind it you know like uh, i feel like I know it's so hard to explain, but I never had issues with people taking pictures or being nice. And everyone was so welcome and nice and 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 everything. And it basically motivates you even more to do what you do. Because a lot of people say like that they enjoy the streaming, they enjoy the races and, and, and stuff. And it just makes you like like back in the head, you're like, wow, this is great. I'm actually doing some good job, you know, because mm. because obviously when you're streaming at home. You see people in the chat, and it's amazing because people are very supportive in the chat. But you also have to deal with the hating and, and stuff like yeah, that. And right. then you're in an expo or anywhere, and you meet your viewers live, and and suddenly they're like amazing, you know, like they're and, and it's like basically like you get like a that person in the chat gets the face, and it's so real. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, so yeah. real, you know, like it is crazy. 
That's very cool. And and you got to meet your teammates as well, right? You were racing while you were there. So, you know, I, I had a similar experience. We were lucky. We we um we took uh, 10 of our sim racing team to the expo. And, I, you know, I speak to these guys all the time. They speak to each other like four or five times a week. Tristan, the team captain, you know, I spoke to on a weekly basis. And you kind of get close to, to the people that you race with and the people that you work with through Discord, but you never really get to meet them. And then that first time that you all meet, it's, it's it was kind of a... For me, it was kind of like a okay. This is a big moment. This is you know this is this is somebody who like I care about that I'm meeting for the first time. But equally, there was also this sense of like I feel like I've already met them. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Like I I haven't experienced it, like meeting people like that because uh, in like two thousand five, six, seven, I was a part of the chick sim racing community in Air Factor One, and we always had like twice per year like a meeting, like an Elan mm. event somewhere, and at this sim expo really was like almost the same thing for me so i was like wow this is exactly what i like you know it's great and yeah as you said like it's, it's great when you meet your teammates i i love it and as you said like when you when we do like 24 hour races together exactly it's like you meet them and you're like hey i know you you know like yeah. i know exactly i know everything <laughs> yeah. about you you know <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> well, what was it like racing in a booth because obviously you, you've raced from the chair that you're in right now you know, countless uh, hundreds, thousands of hours. Like you probably wouldn't want to add them up, right? But then you, you, you then kind of remove yourself from 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 that place, and you go to a different country. You go to the expo hall. There's these little booths set up. Like you've got presumably a partner who's given you a rig, and it's a brand new rig. It probably feels a little bit different. There's there's people standing around you. Like how how is that to deal with? It was too bad. Like I'm honestly, I'm used to it because I did several esport events in the past. So I have to like, I have it in my head. I know exactly what's going to happen and how it's going to look. And it's obviously like a lot of fiddling, a lot of adjustments. Yeah. And basically finding like something in together because one, your teammate likes this, that likes this and you like this. So you have to like make like a meet minute in the middle. Mm -hmm. And did you, have to, did you have to do any of that with your Yeah, yeah, of course. Like my teammates, like I, I'm like, I was taller and, and bigger than my teammate, for example. So we had to like do the rig so it's not too far and not too close, you know, so we can like make it both together. And then obviously he's using different wheel settings and the graphic settings yeah, and, yeah. You and so on. But it wasn't too bad, you know, it wasn't too bad in this. I actually did my first little best lie on the lap time at the event compared to home. So I was like, I was like, okay, maybe I have something set home wrong at home it, yeah know? that's interesting <laughs> because how is that possible i and, noticed that a lot yeah. of the teams had uh, had the shadows turned off so when you as you're walking behind i don't know if this is like an <laughs> esports thing i don't know if this is like the there's a there's some kind of performance advantage they've worked out but maybe six of the booths had the shadows turned off so it looked yeah. like the cars were floating ahead of them and i was like oh <laughs> is this some kind of like pro esports insight that we're getting here yeah, probably like an FPS. You know, like you always have to, you need to have maximum FPS. You know, for esport, always. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. But it was good. Yeah, I said like, I, I like these events because you can also meet your teammates and also the opponents. You know, I think that's even more thrilling. <laughs> in the end, you know, <laughs> yeah, those people yeah. who wrote you are horrible. You know, and you meet them in real life. You know, <laughs> and stuff like that. It's so nice. You know. Yeah, I mean, I'm um, sure it didn't happen too much. Did, did you manage to go around and speak to to the other teams that you're racing against? Yeah, a bit. Yeah, yeah. Some some of the people. Yeah. So okay, let's talk about the uh, the exhibitors because the, exhi the exhibition hall was uh, was very cool. I, I walked around it maybe two dozen times. Like, just keep going to the same stands, just seeing something slightly different there. And for me, there were some some kind of real standout. Uh, booths and there were some standout products and there were some things I was noticing from the expo. But what, what stood out to you? Yeah, yeah, I think it was good. Like for 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 me, what stood out? I mean, it's hard. I was sold in Astatec already before it started mm. because my friend was working there. So I was like, I'm really really looking forward to meet my friend after three years. We know each other online. Yeah, you know, yeah. we never be able to this meet. This is each Alex other. who won the exhibit yeah, race. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And it was like, finally we can meet, you know, so I was like there all the time, you know, in us to take proof. And uh, then uh, what I really like, I, I did like Logitech. Like, mm. I'm not like, personally, I'm not the biggest Logitech fan, but I did like their booth was connected with SGP. Mm. And I have a very close with SGP because they are organizing basically our league or helping us with our league. So and it was so many competitions they had there. Like my teammate won like five headphones, you know, in, a, in those four days. <laughs> Nice. So, uh, yeah, they had the they had a very loud announcer, like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for the whole weekend. <laughs> yeah, that was very so, cool. What, what about products? Did you see any products that stood out? 
I feel like the Simiku pedals were like probably like the best shocker, right? Or like the yeah. most interesting thing that everybody wanted to see and try. You know, two and a half thousand euro pedals. You know, like you have right. to try or see that, right? Yeah, yeah. And what then did you I think? really, yeah, it was like okay. So in, I don't understand why would I need three pedals like this, mm -hmm. right? But uh, the ABS on a brake pedal when I was braking in the spa was the most real feeling I ever had from the pedal compared to real race car. Like that literally, when I was, I was driving a few months ago, I was driving a GT4 Porsche, and this was like, let's say 97% the same feeling that I have in a race car. So I would say that pedal, that brake pedal was like 100% worth the price, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I, so I thought the same thing. I, when, before I got to the expo, I thought that uh, the SimiQ pedal was going to be the, the standout, the headline. That was going to be, yeah. it was going to steal the show for the weekend, <laughs> right? And uh, I went and tried it on the, 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 on the Thursday, and I thought the brake, as you said, was just incredible. It is the next step in sim racing yeah. technology. But actually, what I was quite surprised about was the, uh, the throttle pedal. So, the, I mean, the clutches, I mean, they, they didn't put a clutch in because it's basically, it's basically pointless to have a, a force feedback <laughs> clutch, right? But the, uh, the accelerator, mm -hmm. I felt that I was getting more feedback through the accelerator than I thought was mm -hmm. possible. So, for, just for, just, I've just realized, for people that don't know, SimiCube have just released two, uh, sorry, just a single pedal that has force feedback in it. You could use all three uh, together as the accelerator brake and, 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 and clutch, and you can map them to feel like different cars. And the idea is that they give you feedback. So the brake pedal, for example, you'd get ABS and, and, and the throttle. The throttle was the bit that, that surprised me the most because I wasn't expecting to. So I haven't ra uh, raced a GT4 Porsche, um, unlike yourself, but I have raced uh, an Enduro car, 4KA, which, you know, very similar. <laughs> 69 brake horsepower, it's a beast. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the throttle pedal is like, you know, there's, there's just nothing to it. Absolutely nothing. It's just, you just, you, you just feel nothing. So I was like, what am I going to feel through the Simucu pedal? But actually, I was noticing that you could feel when the tires were starting to lose grip going around a long, medium speed corner. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you hit a curb, then you'd get like a bit of feedback to, 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 to let you know that you'd hit the curb. Now, yeah. it added to the immersion. I don't know if it's going to add anything to the performance, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I did like that as well on the throttle. I, I, I liked, as you said, like when you were going the curb and such, that was really interesting to have that feedback. I did not like the TC because like in, when you're in a real race car and you put the throttle on the max and there's a TC, it doesn't give you anything, you know? Mm -hmm. You can hear like bum, 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 or something about that, but you don't feel anything in the pedal. But as you said, on the curbs and such, it was so... It was such a weird, different feeling, you know. Like yeah. I can imagine, like I can imagine, like a full motion rig, these pedals, like a VR, and you're like in a race car. You, you know? Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. All you need is like one of those haptic suits, like you know the, the Tesla yeah, suit, yeah, where yeah, they yeah, simulate yeah. <clears throat> they simulate G force, and then yeah, you are basically basically racing. Exactly. Yeah. So completely opposite end of the spectrum from two thousand euro pedals, we also saw Coffee Racer turned up with a with a stand i think they turned up halfway through the saturday did you see them the coffee tables that, no the transport no. oh, right. i am so sad because i <laughs> i know i was walking past them and you said they they were not there on thursday no right? they were they weren't there on thursday yeah. and they they weren't they would they turned up very late on friday and they weren't even they didn't even finish setting up until about halfway through saturday oh no <laughs> well yeah i i remember like saturday evening i was walking like going to uh, gomez wheels and i saw that but I didn't like, I, I thought it's like a relaxing area. Yeah, I thought it was like a, like, it was... like a place to chill or something, you know? <laughs> and I just walked past it. And then like on Monday or Tuesday when I was home already, people were like, did you see the coffee racer? It was so funny. It was so good. I was like, what? No, I didn't, you know? It's a very cool concept. The idea is that uh, yeah, you have a coffee table and you, and you pull it out and it's like a, it's like a rig that you can pack away in your living room <laughs> if you haven't got the space. Surprisingly, it, it's it's really quite rigid like there was very little yeah. like give in the in the in the uh, i don't know what to call it the rig the cockpit the the coffee table <laughs> like the table. What, yeah whatever you would call it i heard um, only positive things only positive things from it yeah it was very impressive now the thing that stood out to me the most i thought it was going to be the simi cube that would be the the lasting impression from expert but actually for me the big takeaway was how big the growth has been in asset oh, yeah from last oh, yeah. year to this. So last year, I, I remember seeing the Invictus pedals at Nürburgring last year, and they were in somebody else's booth, just in the corner, a glass case. That was it. So they didn't even have their own booth. They shared somebody else's. And I remember thinking, oh, that, they, they look good. They look very different. They have a very particular style, like black and red. And I was like, oh, that looks nice. Like, you know, a high-end pedal, 
it sounds it looks like it's kind of a little niche company that's doing very specialist oh that's cool didn't really think anything of it and then this year bang they've got like the biggest stand they've got this huge stage with the led lights behind it oh yeah and an entire range of like sim racing electronics like mental yeah yeah unfortunately it wasn't last year at expo because of the pandemic but that's what exactly what i heard you know they, they went for like a little box basically it fell they went to like <laughs> yeah. a massive you know music and party and, and the champagne car. and race yeah. car you know so yeah i mean it's great to see i feel like it's obviously you can see the future of the company is in a good hands probably yeah i mean and they mean they mean business yeah exactly and the product looks good so I feel it's good, you know. Like honestly, I was like pretty shocked as well. I was like, "Wow, you know, like this is amazing." Did you um? Did you have a go on the? Well, I say have a go on. You couldn't. You couldn't do it with your foot, but you could do it with your hand. The ABS pedal. No, no, I haven't. Oh, okay. So they had. So they they had the ABS pedal out, and it was interesting because obviously you had SimiCube with their pedal with the force feedback, and then we had the Aztec pedal, which had an actual ABS pump attached to it, and the the, the line was. This isn't simulation. You can't tell us that this doesn't feel like ABS because it's an actual ABS pump attached to the brake. So you can't say it doesn't feel like ABS because it is ABS. It's attached to the brake. And it, there, wasn't, uh, there was no like working prototype there that you could go and try, but you can kind of lean on the stand and you could put your hand on it and feel the, feel the vibration. But it was interesting. It, it's interesting to see that I think the hardware companies, like a lot of sim racers, have come to the conclusion that we've kind of almost reached the pinnacle of what you can expect from a wheelbase and a wheel in yeah. terms of technology. There's, there's not a lot else you can do to simulate racing a, um, a car, but actually the pedals is one area where you can still innovate. Yeah, it's very interesting because, uh, as I said, I was on the first Sim Racing Expo in 2014 in Nürburgring, and back then you had only Fanatec and maybe some Bogdan, uh, I can't remember, Bogdan something pedals. And that was it. Then you had only motion rigs. Like it was like a big thing back in the day. Like everybody had like motion rigs, you know, like yeah. all kinds yeah, of yeah. rigs. But everybody had like Fanatec or and that was basically it. And and now you can see eight years later how you have like one place with little motion rigs, and then you have so much in like uh, epic wheels, uh direct drive bases, and it's like improving the pedals, getting like a real ABS, force feedback in the pedals. And stuff like that. It's so crazy how it like shifted from from one motion rigs and then VR a bit and, and then yeah. now into like an insanely advanced equipment. Yeah, it's very cool. And and I think the um, I think in the short term the advances we're going to see, the big advances we're going to see are, are just the prices coming down for that for that kind of immersion, that kind of technology. Oh, yeah. So force feedback in pedals going from you know two thousand euros to hopefully somewhere like <laughs> two or three hundred euros. It's going to take a while, right? But Hopefully that's the next um, kind of short-term advancement. But let me put you on the spot. Unfair question. Fast forward to 2028. What do you think the biggest difference is going to be in sim racing hardware in 2028 compared to now? Whoa. Wow. <laughs> I no I honestly like I, I I think in 2028 what we're gonna see is gonna be more connection with real racing. I think the equipment is gonna be like as it is basically. I don't think it's going to go that much forward in eight years or six years. But I feel like there's going to be more connection with the real racing because like we're obviously seeing that more and more and more. And I think there's going to be in six years going to be even on a more different level, you know, in this in this area. Yeah, well, I, I have a theory. I have a theory that the next big thing after pedals is going to be mixed reality. So you, I don't know if you saw Vaj, Vajo, Vario, I'm not mm -hmm. sure how they're, they're pronounced, but they have this concept of mixed reality, right? So you wear the headset, but you can actually see your hands and your yeah. wheel. So you can use all the buttons. Let's say, let's say you have like a Gomez wheel, right? You spent however many hundreds of thousands of euros on one of those absolute beasts of a wheel. They look awesome, right? And then you put a VR headset on, you're like, okay, great. I can't see it. I can't see any of the buttons now that <laughs> I've just spent all this money on. So like, it's completely pointless. But with a mixed reality wheel, you would see your Gomez wheel and your hands, but immediately behind them, that's when you see the game. Oh yeah, that's that is interesting. Yeah, they, they could be good, or like a like a as you said, like a haptic suit or something. You know, that will give you like a more um, more feeling into the car and such. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I know Tesla suit, not related to the company Tesla. I found out recently. <laughs> I thought they were. They're not. Different company, also called Tesla, do the Tesla suit, and they're trialing like this haptic feedback, like pumps 
that go in this <laughs> suit and it's a full body thing so you feel g-force and but here's a question i i wonder with some of these advances in technology i think the things that will limit the kind of the the, the mass appeal for them is how they don't add to performance and but what, what i mean by that is you can add all these things like the haptic suit for example will make it feel very immersive but it's not going to give you an extra couple of tents on your lap time yeah 100 percent. like 100 percent. i feel like uh if you want to buy a motion rig, it's absolutely perfect because you will get close to reality. But in the end, I don't think it's going to make you faster at all. You know, maybe the other way around, most likely. But I think it's like, that's not where the market like wants to go itself. Mm. I think they're uh, doing this stuff to, to prepare you for real racing. Or like if you see like the motion rigs and stuff like that, it's basically getting sold for like companies that are doing something around cars. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So uh, I think it's going that way. And then you have like a separate thing that's like what you have at home. Yes, you know? yeah. And I think I think there's you know there's 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 two main players here that are gonna are gonna kind of influence the domestic home sim racer market more than anyone else. And it's Moser and Simagic. I think the fact that those two are entering the market means that the prices across the board are going to have to come down, right? I mean, it depends, right? Because at the same time, you have, for example, Simic, who shows you 2,500 euro <laughs> pedal, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's, I think it's the biggest difference in a couple of years now that everyone, like, including Fanatec and such, was trying to push the prices down. But, and so you have, like, I don't know, we have Fanatec CSL DD, which is, mm -hmm. like, supposed to be, like, really good for price and, like, for, like, a advanced and, like, a rocky driver. And on the other high, other side, you have, like, a Gomez wheels, for example, which are, like, massively advanced, I don't know, 1,500 euro wheel and 2,500 euro pedal and stuff like that. I feel like what actually it shows that the there's a big amount of people who buy these things and therefore you can see the market you have obviously one part of the market that wants obviously something cheap and available. And then you have the part of the market, which we probably don't even see ourselves, you know, uh, that buys like really expensive things. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And yeah. Well, very, we saw Vasaro there, Vasaro and D-Box. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, like we, we, we see, like you go to Expo, you see, wow, this rake is 80,000 euros. And you're like, who would buy that? You know, like, you know, <laughs> and, and, and then... If you would be more into it and deep into it, you will find out that the uh, showrooms and car companies and racing teams and racing drivers and, and it's like a massive, a completely different market separated from sim racers. And it's it's obviously massive because otherwise these companies would not exist anymore. I was just about to say, Vasaro <laughs> were there at the Nurburgring last year and this year they were there with an even bigger booth. So they, clearly like some 2014, people... Some... 2014, there was Vasaro there as well. So. Exactly. Well, I mean, and of course, it's it's um, it's no secret that Vasaro have just provided the F1 Arcade with, what was it, 40 rigs or something? Exactly, with their yeah. bespoke F1 monocoques, which I don't know if you saw them or tried yeah, them, yeah, but yeah, they yeah. are I saw, yeah. very nice. They are shiny, beautiful... <laughs> Like motion motion rigs, they looked, they did look, uh, they did look incredible. I have a I have a friend uh, that created a company basically of these motion rigs, and I remember like eight years ago, I was like, what the hell, you know, why is he doing? Like he told me like a price, he said like this is like seventy thousand euros. I was like, Pfft. you know, like who who buys that? And now he's racing in you know, the rear race cars, and uh -huh. he has like a massive business around it. So it's. You know, we see the sim racers as we are online and look at our equipment. And then, as I said, you have like completely different side of sim racing with these massive companies yeah. and something we don't see that are working behind. Yeah, it is, it's, it's very cool. And it's kind of like um, the way I see it, and, and this might be a completely like inappropriate comparison, but you know, in the same way that like the, the, the technology in our TVs like came from the space race. I feel yeah, like yeah, the technology yeah, yeah, yeah. on our sim rigs at home is coming from these from these race teams wanting their bespoke solutions, and they kind of trailblaze the technology, and then it kind of trickles down to the the lowly sim racer in the bedroom or the cupboard under the stairs, to use the Harry Potter phrase. Yeah, yeah, agree, I, agree, I, agree, I, agree. It's very cool. So let's talk about real racing. You have ambitions for real racing? Oh yes. <laughs> I, I, so I, I used to be racing very long time ago. I used to be racing, but obviously real racing is very, very expensive. So uh, ever since I tried to get back into real racing, so I was like working and trying to get up the working ladder and everything. And in the past two years, I probably got the closest I ever been. 
since 2006, literally, so in the past 16 years, the closest I've ever been to real racing. And I have definitely some ambitions. And my main goal right now for myself is to lose weight and get in a shape. And within two years, I would like to get uh, into racing. Yeah. <laughs> I've been, I have, I have to, I've been watching your progress on Instagram. Actually, you, you post quite a lot when you go to the, to the gym oh, yeah. and you do your, <laughs> you do your sessions. Does that help? Does it help to kind of, is that like a, is that like a way of um, like kind of like holding yourself to account in a way? Yeah. 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 Because like uh, for me, I'm like a man of my word and basically what I say on a stream or do like tell my chat or my community, I have to do it, you know? So yeah. I, I just, it helps me so much, you know, it helps me so much with the motivation it, and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So let me, uh, let me, let me jump forward again then. So in the same way that I said, if you could go forward in time, five years, what would be the different biggest difference in hardware? What would be the biggest difference in your career? Like, if you could plan out the next five years, where would you want to be in five years? That's, that sounds like an interview question, doesn't it? That sounds, oh, okay. that, that sounds like you're applying for, like, a university. But it's an interesting one. I want to be alive, healthy. You know? <laughs> okay, I mean, you're setting, the, you're setting the bar fairly... Well, I was going to say fairly low, but healthy is, yeah, healthy is important. No, oh, okay. So, like, if you just talk about racing and not, like, a real life and such, if you talk about, like, this only... Uh, I would be I would be like in shape physically, so I would be like very health healthy and health and good in this. I would mm -hmm. be racing in real life, uh, like normally, like I do proper seasons. It would be really nice to have at least like two hundred thousand subscribers. That would, Ooh, be, that would be like five years, you know. In five years, make double. So that, that's my little target. That'd be very cool. And still doing what I'm doing, you know. Maybe on a better games now <laughs> in five years, you know. So like Asuna well, Corsa Competizione two or uh, something Rent like Sport. that. Rent Sport, obviously. Asuna yeah. Corsa two overall and and stuff like that. So that would be that's what I would like to do, you know. It's just just be here and do what I do today, but in the future it'll be still good, you know. I mean, that sounds like a very wholesome set of goals to me now uh, we can talk about ren sport and, and ac2 um, and what you think is coming around the corner but first just while i remember you're six thousand followers away from a hundred thousand mm -hmm. uh, what have you planned for the celebrate you've got you're going to celebrate you're going to do like a, a party stream like you've got to do something right uh for three years i have a same thing i have one thing which is like a meme thing on our community for three years, we had like when I hit 100,000 subscribers on a merchandise page, we could release a Simbra, which is a bra for fat sim racers like me, <laughs> you know, so they can feel confident in racing. This is like a meme thing. And the second thing, which we like keep saying, bra. <laughs> yeah, 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 what we what we keep saying for the past few years, and I'm saving myself for that because I I already got several offers to do it, but I basically said no to everything. I never drove on Nordschleife. And oh. Nordschleife is always like my massive dream track. I have yeah, been to Nürburgring, yeah, yeah. I have been to Nürburgring like five, six times, and I got like many offers to drive, mm -hmm. but I just hold myself for one hundred subscriber, thousand subscribers. I want to wow. get like a, I don't know, BMW M3, BMW M4, put like a camera inside and do like a like almost like on a stream like a commentary first virginity lap, you know, all around Nürburgring. That is very cool. And I mean, you said earlier that you're a man of your word. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know if there's many people who would be offered to drive a lap of the, the, the Norse life and be like, no, no, sorry. I've, I've promised my Discord community <laughs> I won't until I'm at 100,000. That's some serious self-discipline, some serious yeah. like commitment there. Yeah, I, I try, you know, I, I, I said, like, I, I, when I say something on stream, it must be 100%, you know, so. Nice. Love it. Okay, so let's talk about Rensport and AC2. What, what do you think? What do you think? What can be worked on? You know, the the car, the physics models can be iterated on more tracks, more cars, uh, you know, tournament systems. What, what do you think is going to be the, the big new thing? <laughs> I, I, right. I think the next new thing is going to be if someone will copy like Azure Corsa Competizione and combine it somehow with iRacing and they will have a baby, that's going to be probably the best game ever. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. It's so is, hard. Think, like, it's. It's so hard because like everybody wants different thing, right? Like, yeah. it, it, like obviously, I want different thing compared to some other. Like, some people say they they want to do some historical racing, and mm -hmm. and it's like 
like you have to understand the market you have to understand like what people want and what is popular so like a lot of people are like oh my god everybody's racing gd3 now you know blah 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 gd3 is so bad but it's <laughs> the most popular thing right it's like yeah. playing yeah, f1 yeah. you know or driving f1 so um i think like a combination of like Asura the Corsa competition and, and i racing would be like a really good mm. and then like listening to the community and improving the game in a way they will enjoy it more you know so like a proper safety car proper online system uh and and so on so on you know like i yeah. think like it's so hard to tell like what we actually want more from yeah from, from the game because like for example Astro Corsa one is like a perfect game but it's like a bad online system bad uh netcode and it's quite old now mm. but if you like basically refresh it it would be again great because it's modded modded uh system right and i racing is obviously a super great game it's absolutely perfect simulator but it's i don't know 15 years old and the engine is honestly showing more and more how old it is mm -hmm. so i racing if suddenly it would become on a new engine i think it would blow away again oh but you'd all have you'd, you'd have you know? to you'd have to all pay for new subscriptions though wouldn't you <laughs> yeah, they no, would, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't just follow on it would, yeah, you'd yeah. Have, you did a whole you'd have to have to you'd have to buy the premium tier if you wanted the 2.0 version yeah, exactly. And I think <laughs> it's like very important for me, like because this when we were talking about the Project Cars 2, like Project Cars 2 was a great game. And then suddenly developers like stopped doing anything and they basically let the game die, you know, with no updates, nothing. And I feel like our racing is getting so great updates and going forward. ACC got some updates going forward. But I think there's always like a limit where you can like mm. milk it. Until yeah. you have to do something proper, right? Like, yeah. Like, for yeah. example, iRacing, obviously, in, I don't think in 10 years we will see iRacing as it is now, but it has mm. to be completely like iRacing 2.0 in, yeah. for example, Unreal Engine or whatever, you know, uh -huh. like a completely new game, because I don't think anybody will want to play 20 years old game, you know, anymore. No. Well, I, I, I'm I, kind of excited by Rensport because yes. I, I can't put my finger on why, but it feels like they're genuinely building with a blank piece of paper. It feels like they're yeah. they're not trying because the set of course like, I love a set of course a set of course I think will always be my my favorite I it's the one that I just turn on if I want if I've got twenty minutes I just want to yeah. do some laps I do a set of course I absolutely love it I love that it's kind of driven by the community um, it's my favorite but I do think that Rensport has this kind of like magic dust sprinkled over it and I can't put my finger on why but I think it's going to be innovative in surprising ways now i know that there were some horrible hour well, depends on your take on i suppose nfts and crypto right but there were some rumors that that was the direction that they were gonna they were gonna go right uh, yeah obviously like that was the one thing i think they did really bad you know when they did this like news or info or whatever and it blew i think maybe it helped because the they said something which they immediately put away from the table but it blew up with the game you know, so everybody was talking about it, but now it also gave it like a bad uh, name because everyone, every, when you mention Rensport, everybody's like, oh, it's the NFT thing, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So I personally can't say too much about Rensport because I'm actually in a secret Rensport group where Ooh. like we could uh, like getting feedback and everything about stuff. But I haven't even tested the game yet. I have it. I have like all the new updates and everything, but I haven't tested it yet. I'm very looking forward to try it. But... I really can't wait to see it when it's released. I, mm. I think, as you said, like, it looks interesting. I think it's going to bring something new. And I feel like, like honestly, we don't, as a simulator, we don't need too much to be happy yeah. for several years. Like, if you, if you basically look at Azure the Cross Company Siola, like, basically, the game is almost the same for the past, I don't know, two years with some little updates, but we still love it. Mm. And iRacing is literally the same. I don't want to say same, so I don't like piss some iRacings, but it's very <laughs> similar to what yeah. it used to be many years ago. It's just getting a little updates, you know, now mm. and then. And I think like a new tracks, new 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 cars, obviously. And we are like being satisfied. So I yeah. feel like to make us happy, play a new game is not that hard, you know. Mm. If if you if you let's say if you take Astro Cross Accomplice to the physics or like a GD3 physics. And combine it with like a iRacing online system and like being amazing in low all these updates and everything. You you create already like a good game. And if you yeah. give it something extra, then I think it could be like big, you know, like very big. So I'm so very interested about Asura Corsa 2, for example. Yeah, me too. I was, a, I was able to at Spa 24, I was able to talk to Marco Masaruto mm -hmm. and 
like we were talking about it. He was asking what I would like to have in Asura Kurosawa 2. And basically everything I can't say, but whatever, whatever <laughs> I said, he was like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. You know, like, you know, like, you know, <laughs> CCC, you know, like, I was like, oh, okay. You know? <laughs> I, like, he was like, basically like confirming, you know, like winking, you know, like, yeah, yeah, we're going to have that, you know, like, it's like, okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I feel like, obviously, honestly, I think it's very nice because after some time, I think the sim racers actually have something to look forward to. Mm. Because, like, obviously, everybody wants to see Astro Corsa 2, first of yeah. all. Yeah. And after Rensport got showcased and everything, I think everyone is also interested to see that, you know? Mm. And uh, Yeah, because it's interesting that Rensport showcased with, like, GT racing, right? They, they, yeah, they kind yeah, of, yeah. It, it, so that, that was interesting that that was the first thing they showed because it, yeah. it looked good, right? The graphics looked good, but it was... GT racing again, so people. I think, yeah. it, but with NFTs. So I think, yeah, I think it's, it's interesting what you say there about um, is did they did they kind of launch the concept in the in the right way? But then is there you know there's no such thing as bad press, right? Everybody was talking about it far more because of the NFT <laughs> thing, and then they were like, oh no 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 no, that's not what we went at all. So, yeah. but there's something else that was quite interesting that you said was about um, listening to the community and being open with development. Like there's a, a the Subnautica. I don't know if you've ever played Subnautica, or Subnautica Two, yeah, they yeah, yeah, yeah. so they develop uh, completely openly, as in you can go on and you can see their developers' to do lists. Mm-hmm. Like they have a like you know like a Kanban board where you move yeah, tasks across. Yeah. So they have th- their version of that for the developers is open. So you can mm-hmm. see oh they're working on this bug and they make notes mm-hmm. like oh we've got a problem with this but we need to wait for this and then blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. And like, oh we're going to add this feature and then the feature is just like written. So the you know <laughs> so so the gamers can be like oh my god look they're about to add whatever it is to the game and they reckon oh. it's going to take about three weeks and then when it's in progress and then when it's in testing and like oh the alpha testers have got it the beta testers have got it like that I mean that concept i think would be incredibly interesting and incredibly effective because sim racers are a tough crowd right sim yeah. racers care sim racers want to know exactly what is going on behind the scenes because they're also like we're all techies right we all love data yeah. <laughs> like so so like of all the gaming crowds in the world we're the most in exactly we're the most invested in like the technical side of the games so i think whichever studio is the first to kind of do a proper open source development where you can see what's going on i think that will kind of win the hearts a little bit of the of the sim races yeah i think like as you said like for us because we like now sort of thing, it's so great because we know in here almost two years we will have at least two great games coming mm. from sim racing which is like amazing right because you usually don't know that very well and such yeah and the second of all i would like to follow with that like as you said with the Subnautica, that was one of the things that i hated uh, liked sorry liked and loved the most about acc when the game entered like their early access, they were like, okay, in three months, we're gonna release the full game. And they had like a proper roadmap for upcoming, I think year and a half or year, whatever, like Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, what's gonna mm. come in, like, yeah. we're gonna get these three cars, these two tracks and stuff like that. And everyone loved that. I never mm. loved that. And I can feel like, personally, because I'm involved very much in the ACC community, or community what we hate, as you said, is basically being blind or like yeah. blank yeah, you know? yeah so when when suddenly the game for five months is getting no update and there's no information and you have no idea what's going on you're like hmm am i actually playing the right game you know am i mm-hmm. in the right place should i maybe go to iRacing or something you know yeah and uh, like yeah i absolutely love that as well i absolutely agree and i i hope these upcoming games will take something from that because i think the community is insanely important is making their living and and also making the future of the game and i think they should listen more the community i think a lot of developers i'm all developers not only ones but all developers are very proud of their product yeah and they really can't take the negative or overall feedback and it makes the impact you know in a mm-hmm. i mean i'm not talking about sim racing also it's all other games as well yeah you know, like they're, they're obviously you're developed something you're proud of it and then you when somebody says you need to improve something you're like what the hell you know like i created this you know <laughs> how and, how, yeah. how important do you think modding is because mod- modding is uh, it, it's kind of kept a set of courser alive right without mods even things like content manager soul heli courser like it, it, all of these things that make ac so good all yeah. came from the community but of course the studios can't generate any income from the mods mm-hmm. so how important do you think it is for the, the games that are coming out in the future to allow mods i think it's massively good like maybe i would do it a little bit like if you have an apple store like the app needs to be certain like 
parameters and they have to approve it. So I think it would be similar with the mods because sometimes people release every crap they create, right? Mm. But you have like insanely good mods that are actually better than the game, you know, like or improve yeah. the game like Soul for AC1. Yeah, like it's incredible. Hey, this game change is a completely new game, you know, like and stuff like that. And Air Factor One was basically built around the modding community. And then Astro Corsa One basically took over from Air Factor One or even Air Factor Two, right? The Astro Corsa One community took over. And I think the modding is definitely, definitely good. Like, yeah. Like I'm I'm not the person that uses every kind of mod and try every kind of mod mm. but if you look what kind of mods exist for ac1 it's unbelievable and yeah as you said it's obviously taking money away because the licenses and stuff like that yeah yeah but yeah. i i think in a certain area it should be working with the future games 100 percent. cool so we have to do some racing we've got a set of course are both loaded up but before we do i just want to ask one more question what's your take on things like Circuit Superstars and Art of Rally moving into the, the sim racing space. Now, they're very, you know, saying that they're moving into the sim racing space is probably an over-exaggeration, but they seem to have gathered quite a, a following, a love from the sim racing community because it's almost like they're a, they're a break. Have you, have you raced either of them yourself? No. <laughs> no oh, okay. No. Well, <laughs> I, 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 know, I don't know the first game, but the Art of Rally, I saw, I saw videos from it. I saw people streaming it and driving it. It looked very, very nice. Yeah, like, I, yeah. What do you, what do you, uh, when you're not sim racing, what do you game? What do you game? Is that, is that a sentence? What does I mean, one game when he's not sim racing? What do you play? I have like an on off stuff. You know, like I, I basically have like a thing when I'm streaming and doing videos, I need to keep myself not burn out. I have like a cycles, you know, like, so I have like cycle where I, for example, two, three months, I don't play anything apart from sim racing. Mm. And then I have like a two month cycle when I sim race and a little bit less. And at the same time, I'm addicted to some sort of game, you know. <laughs> so uh, what kind of game? What what kind of game do you like? Whatever, whatever. Basically, I can play with friends. Like for two years ago, it was like Escape of Tarkov. Nice. Uh, a few years ago, it was Fortnite. <laughs> uh, I think last year it was Valheim and stuff like that. And for the past two weeks, I'm playing World of Warcraft. I never played it before. Oh, nice. And for the past two weeks, I'm playing World of Warcraft, and I'm looking forward for Christmas to play with my friends the Valheim. It's like a nice. survival game. Yeah, I've been uh, I've been uh, doing a lot of uh, Sea of Thieves recently. It's a nice game where you oh, can yeah, just yeah, 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 there's yeah, a couple yeah. of you just jump in, you just go and do some adventures, and then at the end of it, it's fine. <laughs> there's no there's no sweating, there's no stress. Yeah. It's just a and it, and it's like a beautiful looking game. So yeah. you've chosen. In fact, tell us what you've chosen to race tonight. Oh, we've chosen a Bart. Yes, because it's like a default car in a game. It was actually a racing edition, but if you're driving the normal edition, I, I don't know the server. <laughs> <When> <laughs> yes, <I> started, like, <laughs> instead of the race car, we are driving the road car. We are. It's it's, and, it's got a lot of character. This car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we are in a Mazziona, which I this, this was the demo track for Asuka Corsa One, if I remember correctly. That is a cool uh, fact. I did not know. That is yeah, very yeah. cool. It's like I probably never did a single online race on this track because it was demo track and after release everybody was playing Mugello and stuff like that. So <laughs> So if you guys wanna if anybody wants to join us on track, there are still some uh spaces available. So if you just go to content manager or AC um and you just search for Gridfinder or Jardier or uh, Sim Sundays, any of those, um, you'll find us. <clears throat> We're the only server probably running the R Bath at Majoni, if I'm being honest. So come and um, <laughs> come, come and join us on track. It's just a track day, so we're just going to do some. We're just going to do some laps and chill out. And I've I've got to work out how I turned all my sound off. Now, <laughs> here we go. This is a, this was a great choice. I've got a couple of like go tos when I'm um, if I'm in the office and like you know just doing a load of work or emails or meetings. I just want a bit of a break. I just I usually just jump on um, a set of Corsa, and my oh, recent yes. my recent um, addiction has been the MX5s at Silverstone National. It's oh, so yeah. much fun in VR as well. In <laughs> VR, it's so so good. Right, I tell you what, this car sounds pretty beasty, doesn't it, for a road car? I <laughs> yeah. definitely got my sound up far too loud. I can hardly hear you now. <laughs> right, where are you? Can I see you there? Oh, hang on, I've, oh, I've mapped my H pattern. I forgot about that. To try to make it more difficult for How myself. How about shift as well? Yeah, okay. <laughs> there we go. All right, turn that off. Audio. And again, I remember. Did you play Netcar before I the course by any chance? 
Net car? No, I didn't. No, that's actually the how Kudo started. They did the net car uh, game. Okay. Well, tell us about really, that. Really, really good simulation. That was, that's why everyone was excited about Assassin's Creed uh, One, basically, because the net car was such a great game. You had like a Formula cars and such, and Abart as well. <laughs> That's very cool. I uh, I really enjoyed. Uh, we had uh, Aris on the podcast maybe like three three months ago, and I really enjoyed like nerding out with him about like the physics and the amount of work that goes into these physics models um, to, to kind of make them feel realistic. And actually, it's interesting what you were saying earlier about um, gamers don't like to be left in the dark. They don't like to, you know, as you, the example you gave was uh, five months and no updates. Like, what the hell's going on? Am I racing the right thing? Um, obviously, ACC had the same, that similar issue recently uh, yes. with their console versions, right? So, you know, for ages, the, the, the console version was like a few versions behind the, the PC version, and the community absolutely hated it. And uh, oh, yeah. I, asked, I asked Aris about this, and um, something I didn't realize is that they just completely outsource the development of their, of their console game. So they yeah. don't do it. You know, they, they have I another know. company who, who takes their code, etc., their game, and just translates it almost into PlayStation or, or the Xbox version. And but they the were just waiting on them. The, f the thing is, like, even, like, you tell that, right? You say, we, aren't, we don't have anything to do with the console version. Like, who actually cares in the end? You know, it's still ACC, right? Yeah, exactly, so, like, yeah. You're still, the, you're still the brand. You will, st basically, when you say, I hate this console update, you will say, I hate it, and you will say, I hate ACC, or I hate uh, Kunos, because, like, you don't know who's behind it, and, like, you don't want to Google around and stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, and you, then find their Twitter, my, and then kick off problem. at them. <laughs> yeah, if, if, if I, I don't know, buy iPhone, and it's going to be not working, I will not be like, hey, Apple, you are terrible, right? Like, that's <laughs> basically how it is, you know? I, I really, like, when I heard it about the consoles as well, I was very disappointed. Like, obviously, I understand they probably don't know even how to work with it, right? But the console version overall, ACC is very disappointing, I think. Like, yeah. I, I get messages a lot from the community from consoles, and I feel bad for them a lot. Yeah, yeah, I do, I do too. Because, you know, the, the thing is, the reality is that, like, a console you can buy for, what is it, four, four, maybe not 400, maybe 500, 500 pounds, or maybe 500 euros. So yeah. it's still a lot of money, but it's accessible if you have to. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> Almost took you out there. Um, <laughs> and again. Oh God. <laughs> this always happens on the podcast. I concentrate too much on talking and not enough on breaking points. <laughs> this was the whole point we came to a track day because we found that when we were doing a race, we were so nervous about knocking people out in the race that we just were <laughs> in silence. And you've got this like great guest on the show. We just weren't talking to them at all because all we were doing is, fo is focusing on this race. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the, the sad thing is, like the you know consoles are definitely more accessible, right? Yes. More people can afford to rate to, to to buy a console and game on it. A PC, like if you like, in reality, you've got to be spending seven or eight hundred pounds, so you know nearly double at least to be able to get a PC that is going to run most games today. So yeah. the idea of ACC coming out for people that game on a console was was obviously the the dream for a lot of people so it is a, it is sad that it's uh, it's not worked out essentially yeah it's very disappointing like i i really like as i said like people tag me on twitter or dm me on discord and like asking if i can help them do something with the console and unfortunately just, there's nothing i can do you know basically like yeah what did they want you to do I don't know, probably like make some very angry video about oh. it. You know, like. <laughs> yeah, that is your your YouTube channel is your arsenal, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's like unfortunately you can't do anything, you know, because as you said, it's it's basically not even developed by developers from ACC, so it's not much you can literally do to help. Yeah, I imagine although you're you're absolutely right, okay, it's definitely it's ultimately the responsibility of the publisher. It must be incredibly frustrating for them if they're oh, getting yeah. their PC version so right, but being yeah. let down by the console version. Because, you know, the, 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 the truth is that developers of these games spend, you know, their lives, their hours and hours and hours and hours on these games, and they deeply love them more than most of the, the, the racers will. So it must be kind of uh, heartbreaking when you see bad reviews on a game. Yeah, it's like, 
I know, it's like when you have your YouTube channel and you get like a very bad negative comments, right? Imagine that somebody would suddenly start uploading videos on your YouTube channel that would be not yours, it would be absolutely terrible, right? Mm, people, yeah, people, yeah, people, yeah, yeah. People would hate point. you. People would hate you, basically. Not because uh, it's your brand. Yeah, because it's your brand, exactly. Have you ever had to deal with um, like particularly negative comments on your uh, on your YouTube channel? Oh yes, <laughs> all the time. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a shame that I ask that question, kind of knowing the answer most of the time. <laughs> it's not too bad. I, I mean, I feel like I'm like educating myself and trying to understand it more and like basically react better in a way there's like certain comments that i uh really don't care about you know when somebody i don't know for example calls you fat or something you know like or something i i really don't care about that at all but then you have some comments that are like deep you know they go under your skin yeah and yeah they just touch a nerve yeah and it sometimes hurt but i feel like i'm getting better and better in dealing with it and yeah. it's like as a as a content creator i think it's like a non-stop work you have to do to fix this stuff you know to educate yourself and and deal with it because well you can't have a breakdown <laughs> about like one bad comment you know so yeah and i guess that the statistics are that the more popular you get the more of these comments you're gonna get oh yes yes <laughs> i remember um i remember we had chris hay on the show and uh, he said that he uh, he from the beginning he had a policy that he still has now that he responds to every single comment on every single video for the first 24 hours, I think it is. So as yeah, soon yeah. as he releases a video, he then sets aside time to comment on every single comment on his video. Do you uh, do you do anything similar? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I, I try to like, I, I, would, I, I don't want to say I react to every comment, but I definitely try to react for as many as I can. Yeah. But uh, sometimes I sometimes I just like don't anymore. But I, I definitely like read 100% of the comments, like 100% of the comments I definitely read. Yeah. But that must be a nice feeling, right? When you put a piece of work out and you get comments that are, that are positive to flip this conversation on its head. When you get positive comments, it must feel, uh, perhaps it's not why you're doing it, but it must feel good that you're, you know, you're yeah. making yeah. An, a positive effect on, on people. Especially during your COVID era, era, right? If you said that that was where it really took off for you, I imagine that you're making quite a big difference to people during that time. Yeah, yeah, like, I, I mean, uh, the biggest was when I was in Spot 24 and I had a guy who came and he was like, he started crying and he was telling me that I helped him massively during this this thing, you know? It, it was amazing, like, it felt weird because I was yeah. like, how my stupid driving around can help someone, you know? <laughs> but at the same time, I was like so blessed that it just motivates you more and more and more, you know? And yeah. it also helps basically, as, as we were just talking about, about the negative comments. Because at the same time, I'm like, man, this guy was like the happiest guy ever, you know? So, you yeah. know, you know, screw screw this, you know? Yeah, I also, so, um, I also think that behind every negative comment, there's probably a very sad story behind it. Yeah, of as course, in, there's a definitely you know, the, reason for a person to be negative like that, so... Yeah, so that's that's how they get their kind of, their kicks. I mean, you, you know, you, you put, you're probably not... No. I don't know, living the most rewarding life, if that's the case, which is which is sad, <laughs> regardless of who you are or what you say. Yeah, that's how it is. I feel like, like I, I think we still have it very good. Like, I think, for example, doing some Instagram modeling or something must be much, much, much harder, you know? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> is, I think we are is still that your like... next? Uh, is that your next venture? <laughs> no, 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 no. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> I was when somebody asked me, like, when I'm streaming and the... Uh, Sometimes you have a lot of comments that people are like new to your stream and they ask if, if it's your job. And I like to say like a little meme, I say, no, I'm an Instagram hand model. <laughs> and people are like, oh, nice, what is your Instagram? <laughs> you, know, like... you need to set that up. <laughs> so tell us about the, the gymming. I think I saw in one of the captions that you're doing mainly um, weightlifting. Sorry? For your, uh, you're going to the gym quite a lot at the moment. You, you say, I think one of your Instagram things mentioned um, weightlifting. Is that what you're focusing on? No, 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 definitely not. Like, uh, I have a tr personal trainer and we are doing like a complete one hour workout. Like, oh, and, nice. Uh, and one of the reasons I went was because I will start having like issues with my back. Right. So I wanted to like fix my back. So that's basically what we are focusing on, like the core, core strength of the body. Because yeah. like, I, Basically, because I'm heavy, my legs and my hands are like quite strong, but my like core 
and the back is very weak. So, uh, yeah, we are working on that very heavily, <laughs> trying to improve all that. That's cool, yeah. I, uh, I recently started with a, a personal trainer, and it feels like a huge luxury, especially in yeah, you know yeah. at the moment, it's amazing. Yeah. across the living crisis and everything. But I know it's a bit it's a bit cheesy, right? That you can't put a price on health, but like yeah. it's honestly the best the best thing I've ever spent any, any money on ever. Just that yes. kind of investment in your in your own sense of well being. Yeah, especially absolutely. when you've got such a especially in your case you've got such a like direct application for the benefits that you're that you're developing right if you you know this is your motivation here is is racing real world racing i couldn't yeah. think of i couldn't think of many things that's going to motivate somebody to work harder in the gym than that <laughs> no i just realized such a good lump dude <laughs> i had to go from the pits <laughs> oh my god you know what it, it's uh Whenever we do this section of the podcast, this is when I realize how I don't think I could be a a streamer because <laughs> I, I cannot concentrate on driving and uh, and talking at the same time. As you can tell, I keep stuttering all over the I think I'd be the most infuriating person to have to <laughs> to have to watch on stream. I enjoy it, but it's just oh. Maybe I need more practice at the the driving. I was putting some laps together before um before uh, in fact when you were doing your endurance race and I thought uh -huh. it's going alright. I quite like this. Starting to <laughs> starting to get, get like a bit of a rhythm going and now gone, completely gone. <laughs> I think to, uh, Toby's watching, who is one of our teammates in uh, in the enduro car. So front wheel drive, very similar to these things. He's going to be very. Uh, very disapproving of my lap times coming in at the moment. <laughs> I'm two, two seconds behind. But this yeah, is but a right lot of fun. <laughs> this is a good track, right? Yeah, this is great. This is a lot of fun. I've, um, I actually did a, um, a Clio Cup uh, league, uh, I think it was about a year ago, actually. And it was so much fun. There was always kind of yes, 26, 27 um, uh, Clios going around various different like tight windy tracks <laughs> and it's so good like the racing is so close in ac1 that's great yeah yeah ac1 yeah like we used to be doing the uh, railroad clerk up in pressure cars too and it was like everybody keeps remembering that like whenever you have like a nostalgia everybody's like those pressure cars to races in clear cup you know and it was hilarious yeah but the racing is so close right it's why yeah, uh, yeah, like yeah. one of there's a there's a server at um, on AC that's up like all the time, like 24 hours a day. And it's the it's the one I said earlier, but the Mazda MX-5 at Silverstone National. And it, w when we have the, if we have the computer on in the uh, in the office during the day, that one I kind of just load up, just sit in the pits. <laughs> and then whenever I've got like a little 10, 15 minutes, just go and do some laps. And the, the, the racing is so, so close. I, I mean, often because it's a completely unranked lobby, it's, you know, absolutely terrible racing, but it's very, very close, a very, very like, intense and engaging and exciting there's no you know you're not you're not like looking at your delta like trying to cut off tents because you're like all oh, right if i get a couple of tents off in this lap then that means oh great i'll catch up in like six laps like no 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 you're battling like every single lap with somebody <laughs> it is great it's kind of addictive that's actually that's the like basically that's what i liked the most when i was racing in the race room is uh we were doing like a tcr racing and in a race it was nice. so good you know it was so, yeah. so good i am um, I was fortunate enough at the expo last year. I say fortunate enough. I'm not sure if it was fortunate enough. I raced the TCRs um, that they did at the expo on the stage. Somebody dropped out last minute and Steve from SGP was like, uh, can, can you go on stage and, uh, and race the TCRs? I was like, oh my goodness. Like, and this, you know, I was, I was about to say I wasn't, very, I wasn't a very fast racer then. Not a very fast racer now. I, I, all of my uh, sim racing enjoyment comes from my enthusiasm rather than my skill. Um, but it was uh, a lot of fun when I started to kind of understand those TCR cars and, and kind of get a feel for what front wheel, front wheel driving was all about. It was, uh, yeah, it, it was great. In fact, um, do you know uh, Boonatics, Stefan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So me and him were racing this in this same race. And uh, I think for whatever reason, he hadn't had any time to put any practice in. And I only been able to practice literally on the rig on the stage between various different talks over the expo weekend is the only time I could get like a quick 10 minutes here or 15 minutes there to practice. And uh, me and him just drove around at the back for the whole like half an hour <laughs> or whatever it was. But we had a lot of fun, we had a lot of fun. And that's what matters, right? Exactly, yeah. Right, <laughs> guys? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, one thing I really enjoyed 
at the expo was not just seeing all the exhibitors like you know you'd see all the you see, you go into the, the little media lounge and grab a coffee and you'd see, you know, the CEO of Track Racer talking to the CEO of Simicube or, you know, the CEO of Fanatec talking to the CEO of Assetec. And you're like, oh my God, what, what conversations are they having? That must be so interesting. <laughs> but also it was quite cool on the, the Thursday night at the Assetec party. Um, I was still chatting to, well, I was chatting to your teammate from your last race, um, Eries, having a beer. And yeah. I looked over and I saw you and, Gamer Muscle and Random Cool Sign all sat or just, you know, stood around having a beer and a, and a chat. It felt like a real kind of, um, I don't know, like a community homecoming. It was like, yeah, you know, it's, 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 you know, the sim race, you know, sim racing market is growing, as we all know, but it still feels like there's a, there's a very kind of close knit community of people that are meeting up every year at the, at the expo. Was it, how was it, you know, meeting all the, all these streamers that you've kind of worked with or, or known in the past? Yeah, I mean, it's great because I, like, I know, for example, Gamer must have like four years now. And we met, like, uh, I don't know, like several times already. And it's great to see each other, like, after, I don't know, like two years later, basically, you know. It's yeah. actually like, if you, if, 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 you, if you said it like this, I actually feel sad that we are not, like, hanging out more often. Like, yeah. obviously, everyone is living in a completely different world and a completely different part of the world. So it's obviously not that easy. Yeah. But it's, it's so sad when you see so, like, three years later you know and so was but you're like hanging out online all the time yeah so yeah i definitely thought after you know that expo i was like we should do this more often it was such yeah. a great feeling to to kind of chat to everyone i met um uh gaming muscle so i met him last year at the expo and then i met him again in june uh of this year we both went to the there's a d-box event at the uh, canadian embassy in london to, uh, they were showing off their um their new mark 5 actuators and I went along, I was down there anyway, and, and James was there, Gaming Muscle, and oh my god, I got to the S's just so I started telling my story. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> this is the problem I have. And uh, anyway, we went to the event and it was all great and we did a bit of a, we did a, a podcast. In fact, I think it was like our fourth episode actually, it was actually from the, the embassy, which was quite cool. We spoke to Stefan Vidal um, of, of uh, D-Box, and blah, 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 it was all great. Um, had some drinks and some lunch. And then... Uh, James was like, um, we were talking about the fact that we're both from uh, Kent in like near Maystone, Tovel kind of way. And we were chatting, uh, chatting away. And he's like, oh, I've got, I'm going back to Newcastle. So he's going back to Maystone. He's like, oh, why don't I give you a tour of London? Because I was making a point that I've, <laughs> I've never, I've, I always used to live like an hour from London, but never really uh, got to explore it very much. And he's like, oh, well, I'll give you a tour. So he like, gave me like a tour of the, of the South Bank area in London. And his <laughs> historical like tourist knowledge of London was absolutely incredible. I was, I, I, it was like I should be paying for this experience. It was, it was almost <laughs> like he was streaming as we were walking along the bank oh, and he was kind of giving me yeah, yeah. like a commentary of all of these <laughs> uh like, these monuments around and then when we were in nuremberg uh, at the expo hall i was like oh are you gonna go into into town for any dinner and stuff he's like oh yeah yeah you should try this place you should try that place or there's this church here i was like wow you've like got such an encyclopedic knowledge of yeah. everything you ever talk about it's very very impressive <laughs> we had the same experience at spa you know <laughs> like he was also like a sightseeing guy for free yeah. you know? okay good i'm glad it wasn't just me then he was running out of things to talk about so we just started commenting on the monuments <laughs> <laughs> but yeah for me it was great because like i obviously met gamer muscle radical sign like a few times already and uh, it, it was brilliant because we spent like a weekend together at spa 24 this year and we obviously like had a beer, food and everything together. And now we basically met like three months later or four months later. And That's very cool. it was so, I, I was so happy. I was in such a happy place, you know, and obviously I also met my teammates at Spa and then I met them, met them, most of them again here at Nuremberg. And it was just, I was like, man, I really remembered like I said, like he was like 2006, 2007, 2005. And we were doing these sim racing events in our Czech sim racing community like twice a year you know like in, in in March and then in like November it was so great because like obviously you're living in this sim racing world online and then yeah. when you actually meet in like a real life it's so nice you know yeah no 100% I uh the the spa 24 hours sounded incredible I had lots of stories coming out of there um oh, yeah, yeah. I was quite I was quite jealous it looked it looked it looked great and then at the expo this year, we did a um, an interview with um, Thomas Yakimaya, here of Fanatec. Shameless yeah. plug. It's uh, av available on Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts now. Um, 
And uh, we went around that. They had that very cool 25 years of, uh, of Fanatec stand, which oh, yeah. was like the thing that I proper nerded out out there was the um, the Command and Conquer like control uh, oh, command oh, pad. Yes. It was so cool. I, I I sunk hours and hours and hours <laughs> into that game when I was a kid. I used to love Command and Conquer. <laughs> so we uh, we had it. We meant to have about 10 minutes, but it ended up being about half an hour. This interview, and we were nerding out over Command and Conquer, and then the Puma Rally box and the Button box and blah 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 blah. And then I was like, oh, you should we should do a, a proper um, a proper episode. We do like 45 minutes to an hour, uh, and if you want to race, it's an hour and a half long episodes on Sunday nights at eight o'clock. Um, and he was like, oh, yeah, I mean, that sounds that sounds good. I'd love to do that. But why don't we do it at um, Spa this year? And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, well, we do the Spa 24 hours. Why don't you come and we'll, you know, we'll 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 record it from there. And I was like, um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Sorry, let me just check my diary. Oh, wait, yeah, no, I'm free. That'd be great. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's uh, I'm kind of looking forward to that. It'd be very cool. I mean, he is a very, very cool guy, but I suppose if you're like CEO of a company like Fanatec, you, you're kind of going to be a cool guy, right? You're not, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not like, looking for an office job. Yeah, exactly. Like I, I, I do like it as well, because as you said, like on the expo, you had like CEO of Asetec and uh, Fanatec and so on. And you could just like talk to them, like an all every other person, you know, like just, you just meet them and talk about real oh, racing, yeah. talk about serious and such. And it's so, so nice. I, I, I really do like this, you know. It's same like when you meet Jimmy Broberg and stuff, you just ask about real racing and ask about sim racing and so on. Yeah, you, you everyone is so Hustle, human. You know, and... Yeah, 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 exactly. There was, I love the, there was, there was, there was no kind of feeling of like, oh, well, I'm not talking to you because I've got 20,000 more followers than you, or I'm not yes, talking to you because exactly. you're, you're, you know, you're just doing a podcast and blah, 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 blah. You know, everyone was just... If you were there, you're a sim racer, and if you're a yeah. sim racer, they were happy to talk to you. It yeah, was we had, um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We had like we had dinner on Friday and Saturday with some like colleagues and such, and and we invited like like Lawrence, for example, Lawrence and so oh, on, and, and so on. And I like and they were like, dude, I don't have like that many subscribers. Like we're like nobody cares. You know? <laughs> like cares? we are all people. You know, it's like not on your on, invitation. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, that's very good. I actually felt a bit bad because I um I kept seeing Lawrence around the expo hall. So as I was wandering around, speaking to whoever, or I was just doing a, just a bit of a lap just to kind of have a bit of time and whatever, just have a look at some of the products on my own. Yeah, yeah. I kept I kept seeing him. But at one point he was sat at the um like the Nintendo Switch thing that okay. I'm not really sure what was going on there. But there was like that you could go and play Wii. Yeah, yeah, like Wii yeah. Sports, whatever it was, and he was sat there, and I and I went and sat next to him. I was like, "Oh, how's it going?" He's like, "Yeah, yeah, good. You know, just uh, done a lot of content, so I'm just taking a few moments just to do my social and kind of catch up." And I was like, "Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, how you found this?" Like, "Yeah, yeah, good. Just uh, you know, it's obviously it's very it's very intense, so uh, I just need a a couple of minutes just to myself to sort this out." And I was like, "Yeah, oh yeah, that's great. Have you seen such?" He's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that's great. And now I'm just taking a few moments to myself just to sort myself." And I was like, "Ah." <laughs> Uh, I see what's happened here. Uh, and I, I did that like I did that two or three times across the expo. I just find him sitting in these little like booths around, and I'm like, "Hiya!" And he's like, "Oh, for God's sake, I'm I'm trying to do my socials, man." <laughs> I'm kidding. He's you know he's the friendliest guy in the world. He was he was very accommodating, but I did I I, I could tell that I was I was encroaching on his admin time. <laughs> oh my goodness! I think my ties have gone. My ties have gone. This is so much fun. It's a great combination, right? Car and this track. is, it's, uh, yeah. Do you know what? I think I should turn my force feedback down. It, it's windy, right? It's really windy. Like you're constantly doing U-turn. Do you know what it feels like? It feels a little bit like a go-kart track, especially oh, in yeah, these yeah. cars, which is no bad thing. This, this, this track released on a demo of Azure Corsa with the Lotus something. Oh, nice. It That'd was like so much fun. It was like so crazy how the game was good. Hmm. I've recently fallen in love with the um, the Praga uh, in AC1. It's oh, yeah, yeah. so much fun. It's got so much character. It's got like, a decent amount of speed. It's really, really fun in the corners. And what we realized last week is that it's, it looks like incredible in VR because you've got that quite like tight, kind of like uh, almost claustrophobic um, cockpit that you sit in with that oh, with yes. the kind of the rounded window. But in VR, that looks spectacular. Especially like with soul and you know the, the light coming through the it's the, you know the sun coming through the window it's <laughs> absolutely beautiful. Yeah, yeah. 
So you must be, your shoulders must be able to fall off after you've done, was it 23 hours of racing plus oh, three fine. hours today, plus, I'm, I'm <laughs> plus fine, <I'm> this. <laughs> I definitely must say that since I started working out, this improved massively. I used to be having oh, like really? wrist issues and shoulders hurting. Yeah. And, and so, but literally after this weekend, I'm completely fine right now. That's good. I, uh, when we were doing the 4K racing, obviously I, uh, I went to the gym and just, you know, to train my neck, you know, for the G-forces. Mm -hmm. go, going around Donington at sometimes up to 80 miles an hour on the straights, <laughs> on the straights, and then realized, like, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> like, there is absolutely no need for me to be doing this whatsoever. <laughs> if anything, I just need to go for a jog because the stints are like an hour and a half each. Like, the, the, this is completely fine. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know what you mean. Cool, well, I'm gonna pull over because I've just seen the time. It is half past, well, it's nearly half past, 28 minutes past. So let me go to the pits, bring up my thing. Well, thank you very much for for joining us. This has hey, been- it was a pleasure. It's been This pleasure. has been so much fun. This has been so good. Um, yeah, I really appreciate you giving me up your time, especially after your incredibly busy schedule this weekend. Hasta luego for all you guys. It's been good. It's been fun. It's been fun to talk about the story. It's been fun to race the uh, the Arbas around. So thank you for coming on the show. Is there anything you want to say to anyone listening on Spotify, Google, or Apple Podcasts? Just thank you so much for <laughs> listening, guys. And I hope you enjoyed our talking about everything. And uh, hope to see you in the next episodes in the future as well. And make sure to leave a like and download from Grid. Oh. Thanks. <laughs> thanks for the plug. Well, that was just what I was going to do. <laughs> so I don't need to anymore. So in that case, I'll just say thanks to the sponsor, Track Racer, that again, because I keep wearing a jumper at the beginning because I walk through Newcastle, which is cold, and I'm like, oh, I keep my jumper on. And then I race and I sweat into the Track Racer rig. So thank you for Track Race, uh, to Track Racer for giving me a rig to sweat into every Sunday night. This has been great, and we'll see you all at the next episode. Thank you very much. Goodbye.